never touch the TV again. Right? And, and this is kind of what the Pharisees did. Instead of listening to the spirit of God's law, they just looked at the letter of the law and they took it too far. So not only did Gracie ignore the spirit of what I said, she avoided doing what I really wanted. She spent all of her time policing everyone else. And so what I really wanted was not for her to not touch the TV. What I really wanted for her was to join the rest of the family and the work I had for us to do. And so the Pharisees were kind of like this. They not only tried to keep people from doing that, but they didn't join in in what God really had for them, the life that he had for them. And let me tell you something. God has an abundant life for us. It's abundant life filled with work and obedience and joy and celebration. It's all these different things wrapped into one. And God wants us to enjoy the things that he's given to us. And we need to understand that when God says, thou shalt not, he's saying, I love you and I want to protect you. And when God says, thou shalt, he's saying, hey, come partake of my goodness. I've given this for your enjoyment. Jesus is trying to tell these Pharisees and these disciples that they were going to have to change the way. They're going to have to stop listening to the traditions of the elders, to the traditions of the Pharisees, and they're going to have to start listening to the spirit of what God was trying to tell them in his law. And he, he used a couple, couple things, a couple examples. He used a, a patch, a new patch, an old cloth, and he used old wineskins and new wine. You, you see, like, what would happen is you get a if you had a, a tunic, like I'm not wearing a tunic today, I left it at home, it's at the dry cleaners. Uh, but if I had a tunic on right now and it had a hole in it, uh, I would put a patch of cloth on it, right, to mark up the hole. But if my tunic got wet, then as it would dry and that cloth had never been shrunk before, it would shrink up so hard that it would just rip an even worse hole in my tunic. And, and here's the thing, you know, you can only put so many patches on a piece of clothing before it's time just to get a new piece of clothing, right? Like you can only patch it up so much before it's just one big patch. It's not even clothing anymore. And then he talked about wineskins. And here's the way wineskins work. It's not like a bottle of wine like we think of today. It's an actual skin that they would use, a hide, and they would put new wine in it. And when you have new wineskins, it's got elasticity to it. It's not worn out. And so you put new wine in there. What happens when you put wine, new wine in something, over time it begins to ferment, right? And as it ferments, it lets gases out. That's why our modern day wine bottles, right, they have corks on them or they're, or they're aged in barrels because it takes time and they need to breathe or the barrels will explode or the, uh, the wine bottle will explode as it ferments more and gives out gases. So that's what happens in the new wine skins as the gas, as it lets out gas as it ferments, the wine skin expands with it because it's got elasticity it's new, and it can take it. It's not stretched to its max, but the old wine skins, they've already been stretched out by some wine that they've had before. It's kind of worn out. They're typically brittle, and all their elasticity has been used up the first time. So if you fill them completely full with new wine, over time that wine begins to ferment, and it stretches, and it stretches to those old wine skins. They just can't withstand the gas that's building up inside them before, and they'll burst. And when they burst, the wine skin's ruined. You can never use it again. And all the wine spills out, and it's ruined. And you can never use it again. And so Jesus is saying, he's saying, look, I am something new. Jesus is the new patch of cloth. Jesus is the new wine. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how to do things. They've always done things, but still listen to Jesus at the same time. And Jesus is saying the two aren't compatible. Something's going to have to change. To put it in modern terms, iPhone, there's a, something in technology called planned obsolescence. You've probably heard this. If you've ever had an iPhone, for sure, what happens is you have an iPhone and then they come out with a new model, right? And uh, they come out with new software updates. And what happens when they come out with a new model, you notice your battery doesn't last as long anymore. Anyone ever experienced that? Like new model comes out, new update comes out, now your battery's gone in like 20 minutes. And then they come out with a new model and a new software update. And then your battery really doesn't last. And then all of a sudden your phone starts acting really funny. And then all of a sudden you can't download any more updates, software updates. And you can't download certain apps anymore. We have a, an iPhone 5 at the house now that's, that's older that we just use as an iPod. Eva uses it as an iPod for her. And it gets so frustrating for her because she tries to load all these new apps on it and none of them work. Because 
The, I, the old iPhone can't receive the new updates anymore. And without the new updates, you can't download the new apps. And so it's getting to the point where it just doesn't work anymore. And, and here's the message I want you to hear from all this. Oftentimes what we try to do is we try to fit Jesus into our lives instead of working our lives into the way Jesus wants us to live. And what happens is we just go on doing the same thing over and over, and Jesus is just like a little add-on, just like a little tack-on, a little addition. But Jesus is saying we need to be made new. We're the old wineskins. We're the old cloth, and Jesus is the new wine and the new patch. We have to match him or things will not, be, not work out. You know, we try to make God an add-on or, or just in case. We say things like, I'm a good person, but just in case... I'm going to go to church. We say, I'm a pretty good person, but just in case, I'll say a prayer. Just in case God's really there. Or just in case, I'll start to read my Bible. Look, those things are good. But if it's a just in case, it doesn't cut the muscle. The Bible says that God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So if you say that you're following Jesus Christ, but you're willfully, knowingly breaking his commandments and living in sin then eventually the wineskin's going to burst. Eventually the cell phone's not going to work anymore. Eventually the patch is going to rip away and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be nasty. Something's got to get. You know, Jesus was talking to someone and he said, uh, he said, you know, you have to be born again. And the guy's like, what, what do you mean? I got to like crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, with well, man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And then he went on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God wants you and he wants me to be made new. He wants you and he wants me to be born again. We don't need to think that we're doing God any favors by just showing up to church. It's arrogance of us to think that we're so good and that God can just be some little trinket or some little fail-safe in our life. So we have to expect that when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that we will change. God is going to start talking to us through his word, through our circumstances, through people, through the Holy Spirit. And he's going to start convicting us to change what we're doing, to change the way that we live our lives. Here's the other thing that I'm going to point out to us as a church. We don't need to expect people to change who are not followers of Jesus Christ. A lot of times we look with arrogance at the people around us. And we think, oh man, they just need to get their lives together. Right? But if someone doesn't know Jesus Christ, we can't expect them to live with the same obedience that we live if we follow Jesus Christ. If God isn't in their life, we can't expect them to follow God. Why would someone do that? But I think a lot of times as a church, we sit in a judgmental seat above people and say, oh man, they're just so messed up. Well, man, look, they're not following God. Like God hasn't come in and started to change their lives. We can't expect that from them. Our job is to love them, to pray for them, to let them know that God loves them and has an abundant life waiting for them. But our, God, our, our job is not to sit here and to think that we're better than everyone else. That makes us just like the Pharisees. The change is always far better than if we just kind of try to tack God on to our lives. That's the abundant life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. But you can't have an abundant life if you're trying to stuff new wine into an old wine skin. If you're trying to download the latest operating system for an iPhone 4, it doesn't work anymore. And that's a lot of times what we're trying to do with God. He wants us to be made new. Ellie, I'm going to ask you to come on up and start to play as we wrap up. I'm going to kind of pivot real quick and just kind of bring this home in, in another way. One of the things that I believe God wants us to change, and one of the ways I think he wants us to change us, is to change our heart for people. See, before we follow Jesus Christ, I feel like our tendency is towards selfishness. 
we think about ourselves, we think about our family, and that's it. Like, that's, that's just kind of what's important. But after we meet Jesus Christ, we realize that God is an unselfish God, that Jesus is an unselfish Savior. Like, he gave his life for us. And so we begin to see things differently because we begin to say, man, I can live this life of sacrifice. I, I can give my life. I can start to think about other people. And one of the best ways I know to love radically other people is to pray for them. And so I talked about this last week. I want to talk about it again this week. Now, it's a challenge I'm putting out to us as a church. It's to find your five. Okay? I want to challenge you to find your five. And here's what I mean by that. I'm challenging each of us to find five people in our lives, friend, family member, co-worker, neighbor, whoever, who is far from God and commit to pray for them this year in 2020. That's it. Just find five people. Maybe, maybe you know them as soon as I say it. There may be like three or four people that just like instantly you know. Maybe you need to think about it and ask God, God, who do you want me to pray for? And God will lay people on your heart. But I want to challenge all of us to find five people who, as far as we know, are far from God. Because God wants us not to be far from Him, but close to Him. That's why He sent Jesus. And so five people who are far from God and commit to praying for them. Like, not just when you think about it on occasion, but like, I'm talking like every day of the week. Begin to pray for these. It doesn't have to be like a five-hour prayer. But every day of the week, you're going to pray for these five people. You're going to learn what they need prayer for, and start praying that God would answer prayers in their lives. You've got to start praying that God would bring them closer to Him. And that God would put people in their lives that would point them towards Him. And so, just as we think about living a life that's marked with joy, and living a life that's marked with change, one of the changes I want to challenge us to make as a church is to start praying for people in our lives who are far from God. Let's pray. God, you're awesome. We love you. And uh, Lord, we thank you for this journey um, that your son Jesus has already taken in this life. God, on this earth. And um, God, he can relate to us in so many ways, including being tempted. Um, God, in, in every way like we've been tempted in this life. But God, the one way that he can't relate to us is that he resisted the temptation. He never sinned. And so because of that, he was able to be a perfect sacrifice um, for our sins on the cross. And so we thank you for that. God, I pray that in response to what Jesus has done, that we will live lives marked with joy. God, that we will live a life in celebration of the salvation we have through Jesus, of the communion and the relationship that we have with you. God, and the love and the fellowship that we have with one another. So let our lives be marked with joy. God, let our lives be marked with change. Lord, I pray today that that change will begin with loving for, loving and praying for other people. God, show us who you want us to pray for as individuals and as a church. And God, I pray that you will hear our prayers and that you will answer our prayers and people who are far from you. God, maybe people who are hurting or have been hurt by the church even, Lord, people who feel hopeless, God, that they will come to you and come to know that you love them and that you care for them and they have worth because they were created in your image and you love them. And they'll come to know that because you're answering our prayers. And so, God, I, I just pray that as we sing for you during this uh, time, Lord, that you'll just, um, Lord, seal our hearts together, knit them together for this purpose. God, I pray that if there's anything in our lives that's unpleasing to you, Lord, that will confess it. God, that will turn from it. And we'll begin that life of change today. Maybe it's just obeying your commands, Lord. Maybe it's, maybe it's just doing the things that Jesus did, living and loving like he did. And God, maybe some of us just need to learn how to live with joy. And God, I pray that you'll show us something in our lives today that we can be joyful about and celebrate. And Lord, I pray that as we celebrate that will come through as we sing to you today. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name.